So to recap the end of Face the Raven, the Doctor is sent away somewhere with a bracelet. He's sent away somewhere by some people. Yes. And me. And Clara's death. So he's very he's very cross. He's not in, he's not in a good place. He's not in heaven. He's um, not. But he is sent to Hell. Hell. Heaven sent. Yeah, except that title makes no sense. Shall we? Yes, let's, what, why on earth is it called Heaven Sent? Let's not talk about why it's called Heaven Sent, because that could take up your two hours of life left to live. I will say this, I think the title should be swapped. Hellbent, he's hellbent on getting out of the, of the, of the yeah. castle, maybe. And then Heaven Sent, Doctor comes down to save Clara from Gallifrey. Right. Sent to, to take her away from death. Yes. That, that makes more sense, yes. does it not? Though Hellbent is a more dramatic sounding title oh, that, 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 that you give your finale. Yeah, you can't make it yeah. sound like the next one's going to be any easier to get yeah, through. Yeah. Anyway, whatever. Heaven Sent. Uh, my opinion, Stephen, is that it sucked because it didn't have David Tennant and Paul McGann in it. Would you agree with that? I really, really thought that this would be improved by Christopher Eccleston and Patrick Troughton in it. Oh yeah, no, no, where were yeah. they? In all seriousness, yeah. with every bone in my body, I love Heaven Sent. Yeah. What a terrific... So yeah. this could have been the finale. I might have been happy. Mm-hmm. I'd have been happier, maybe. Um, this is the most fascinating idea, the Doctor on his own, firstly. It's sort of the listener of this series in that it's not really family friendly entertainment. It's more the kind of thing it's made for the likes of us. It's, it's a lot more experimental. And it's nice that Doctor Who can be experimental. It's nice that it can do that. Stephen Moffat said he kind of almost went mad. When he wrote this one, it was hard. Right, yeah. It was really bloody yeah. hard to delve yeah. into the mind of this character and justify the amount of talking to himself that I think he's done perfectly. It felt very natural to me. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was probably my highlight of the series. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it was probably, probably my highlight of the series. Yeah. I love that the Peter Capaldi Doctor is, is the sort of one that can just give a monologue to the audience. Yes. Um, Doctor Who... It plays by its own rules. And I like it that Stephen Moffat very much states this is a, is a special show, so we can play by whatever rules we want. If we want episode four to open with the Doctor looking out of the camera to the audience, giving a lecture, yes. then we can do that. Yeah. That's allowed. And just as much, we yeah. can do this. Exactly. And I mean, I think like ever since Listen, when it opens up with him doing his hypothesis explanation speech like they have been building up towards the Peter Capaldi only episode I mean there's a couple of episodes in this series which barely feature Clara yeah I mean uh, the Zygon invasion inversion features a lot of Jenna Coleman not that much Clara and the woman who lived features only Clara at the very end yeah so it's like Peter Capaldi can play doctor and companion simultaneously well, yeah and also what 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 fit makes this story so suited to Capaldi's doctor is that he more than any of the other ones, finds it the hardest to cope with himself. Hmm. He's sort of wrestling with the, his obligations, the things he always has to do. Mm-hmm. He's just finding it so bloody difficult now. Yeah. Matt Smith probably just felt quite comfortable. He you know, usually feels quite comfortable with yes, what he yes. has to do. Until he, stops, he to do yeah, until he stops to think about it, and then sometimes he looks a bit moody for a scene, but then he gets over it and he, he goes to find some cake. Yeah, and he was the last Doctor, and he probably knew that very deep down in his head, but he didn't... That's why he was just having fun. Yeah, he, he just... Yeah. That, that was his emotional uh, uh, retreat, mm-hmm. so to speak, was to get in a young body, put on a yeah. bow tie, dash around the universe, fucking forget it. Yeah. I'm going to die, yeah. who cares? And then even after dodging death so spectacularly... Mm-hmm he's starting to seriously struggle with his own identity. Yeah. Because what you have essentially in Capaldi's Doctor, maybe, after the events of Day of the Doctor, you've got the War Doctor, the Tenth Doctor, and the Eleventh Doctor all shoved into yeah. one. Yeah. Maybe. Well, I mean, the guilt is there. I mean, but all the compare the this to our last Gallifrey story in which the Tenth Doctor was going to shoot Rassilon, going to shoot the Master, oh, going to shoot Rassilon, going to shoot the Master, and he couldn't make himself do it. This Doctor just shoots the General. He's like, yeah, we'll get on to that with Hellbent. Yeah. But, um, okay, so I think there's four people here that should be just absolutely applauded for mm-hmm, everything mm-hmm. in this episode. Uh, David Tennant yeah, for introducing me to the, the love of the show. Uh, Russell T. Davis for creating Jackie Tyler, the greatest mother in all of Doctor Who. Okay, Stephen Moffat, yeah. as we said, wrote a brilliant script here. Don't know how he managed it. It's intensely yeah. imaginative yeah. Uh, and it makes sense. That's what mm-hmm. I'm nice. 
Rachel Talalay, mm-hmm. um, spectacular director, probably my yeah. favourite Doctor Who director. Mm-hmm. I mean, she took inspiration from Citizen Kane when she Good. did this. Yeah. There was a lot of, she said there was a lot of harsh shadows and a lot mm-hmm. of uh, uh, well, oh, I love the look sort of it. Sort of 1920s delicious. horror yeah. sort of feel with it. The veil mm-hmm. is a spectacular design, extremely yeah. creepy. Uh, you know, you can tell why this is the kind of place yeah. that would frighten the Doctor. Yeah. And, I don't know, cinematography, like when... Do you remember that scene where he's eating soup and it's just a silhouette of Peter Capaldi and it holds on him on a sort of slow pan? I do, that, clearly. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I'd be happy if Rachel Tunnel and I directed every episode. Uh, she did a great job last year as well. I understand she directed the Peter Jackson Doctor Who little YouTube video too. And I thought it was genius, the minimalism what? of the direction. She just put the camera there. She just said, this is where the camera, yeah, the one angle yeah. needs And she to be. knew, she knew to just let it play out. Yeah. I, yes, well, to... to like, I don't think that this is the only episode which, which really indulges in the image of the Twelfth Doctor. I mean, there are some shots in even even The Girl Who Died, where he's just being in silhouette or looking into a sunset or something. Yeah. Uh, I love the image of, of the, the one that they showed us, of him walking away from the Gallifreyan Citadel with a guitar on his back and, mm. his, and his jacket slung over his back. I think it looks incredible. He looks incredible. He does. And the fact that he doesn't have one distinct costume, like Matt Smith's bow tie or David Tennant's suit, kind of says that... It's it's sort of the face. Yeah. The face is the defining feature of this doctor, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's not a bow tie or, or sand shoes. Um, it's because it's the face that is reminding him whatever the explanation was. Yeah, that's what you need with Capaldi. It's distinct yeah. enough that you don't yeah. need a fez or a bow tie. Yeah, or a leather jacket. Or a leather jacket. Yeah. But it's nice to have a, that sort of velvet, red velvety one. The red velvet one is rather gorgeous. That's, that's, that's going to have to stay. My it? favourite is, is his, um, his sort of the galaxy t-shirt that he wears underneath his shirt sometimes. It's, like, oh, it's got yeah. white spots. I love that. It's quite hobo yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, um, and his hoodie. I enjoyed his hoodie this year too. Mm. So, okay, I think there's something really interesting to be said here. In, in, in Series 9, right, mm-hmm. they begin writing it probably mm-hmm. some point last year. And they think... We've, we've still got Clara, mm-hmm. we've still got the 12th Doctor, uh, he's not found Gallifrey, what do we do? Mm-hmm. Where do we go? Mm-hmm. So what they do is they challenge themselves every step of the way. Yeah. Heaven sent every single, like Capaldi was coming in to film shots for this episode when he didn't need to be. Yeah? Yeah. He was that dedicated to it. Wow. He was a third director in a sense. That's incredible. Now. And him being a director himself, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. He believed that his vision for what Heaven Sent was supposed to be, combined with Rachel's, combined with mm-hmm. Stevens, somewhere in that yeah. was the recipe for a perfect Doctor Who episode. Perfect. And so they found it, because as they challenged themselves, mm-hmm. and this is what Doctor Who magazine was talking about in their sort of after-image bit, when they summarised, yeah. okay, what do we think of Series 9? Mm-hmm. And they said, we thought it was amazing. And you know what it is? It's because there's this fresh dynamism that comes from challenging yourself constantly, which is yeah. what Stephen Moffat was absolutely doing mm-hmm. with this one, for example. So as 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 Stephen Moffat painstakingly uh, tries to put together what is essentially, in my opinion, the best series we've ever had, the Doctor is spending a day and a half yeah. climbing from the bottom of the tower to the very top. Mm-hmm. And in his head, he'll have a million times perfected the calculation of exactly how many years he was going to have to stay in this mm-hmm. puzzle box in order to punch through yeah. that diamond wall. It's yeah. 20 feet, he knows what material it is, and he knows the probably the average force that a, a single mm-hmm. human punch, a Time Lord punch, yeah. can muster. To be fair, it's probably a little more for a Time Lord. Well, yeah. I mean, it would take longer for us humans. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah. Anyway, so see, he knows exactly how long it's going to take, yeah. and how... And, he's, How, and, he, yeah, he's and he is prepared to... to do that just to not give Rassilon what he wants. Yes. I'm, yes. Pretty, I'm pretty sure he worked out it was Rassilon from the very beginning. Quite, quite being, possibly. Being the dog. But in yeah. crawling up all, 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 close yeah. to death and yeah. bleeding. Yeah. He is bleeding out it's of his Harold, face. Yeah. It's horrific. Uh, well, you know, Tom, we've covered how, how my favourite Doctor Who episodes always... Like, Toby Whitehouse is very good at taking a character that externalises certain traits of the Doctor that therefore bring out those traits in the Doctor. Here, Stephen Moffat is kind of doing a send-up to the entire concept of regeneration, in that he dies every time and he suffers. Yes. But he keeps going to save the universe. He keeps going to to keep going, and I, I, it's painful. It's it always is. painful. 
And I think it's so much more beautiful than this, this speech that David Tennant gets at the end of his. And it's like, every time I die, but then another man walks away. And I'm like, no, this, I think this did it better. This, this is I death. think this did it this better. I think this did it better because it showed you, it didn't tell you what to feel. Yeah, no, David Tennant was tortured internally. Peter Capaldi was tortured both internally and externally mm. for billions mm. and billions of years and the, here. But in a way that the audience gets to feel it. Yes. It was it was a God, it was a tangible it. episode, wasn't it? You could almost you could almost touch the blood on his face. It was it was painful. Yes. Feeling like the bones in his hand crack open. Oh I mean, god. Yeah. Oh god, when he's writing bird in the sand and you can see yeah. his hand shaking yeah. like this. Oh it's, yeah. it's gross, but yeah. it's but it's it's not quite Levels of you know macabre mm-hmm. or, or or just like ugh, downbeat. Yeah. It's thrilling because he manages in the end, and it's the mm-hmm. most powerful message about not giving up the show has single-handedly mm. ever done. And you know what? It was very appropriately timed for me as well mm. because at this time uh, the main bulk of my work had finished. Mm-hmm. I was essentially just left without any lectures, but only exams were coming yeah. up. I was left on my own. Yeah. And I was thinking I can't work anymore. Yeah. Uh, but in a sense, this episode sort of re- resonated with me yeah. that I could think, okay, well, if we can do that, then we can go and yes. try and do yes. as much as hard as I can. If Capaldi these can do a performance that incredible, then, yes. you, then you can work on your craft. Well, hopefully. And if, well, and if, and if and Stephen Moffat can write that script, yeah, and, and, and if, if fictional well, character, while doing it. and if fictional character of the Doctor can 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 do this. Then I too can punch a hole in a crystal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I and mean, he did this supposedly because he didn't want to tell what the hybrid was, but also kind of because he wanted to get back to Clara. Uh, I, there's a couple I, of well, mixed things here, but this well, is ties into there's a couple of mixed sense. things, but also I think in a certain way he viewed it as his penance for letting Clara die. Mm. There's an aspect of that. Yes. He misses her. They're, they're, he's punishing himself. He's punishing he? himself. He doesn't want to give the timelines what they want because they've taken Clara from him. And then there's the, you know, the, so the, the, there are a few things going on possibly. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you something uh, about Missy now. You may. Let's say, so this, this, this whole castle, right, is mm-hmm. built around the Doctor's childhood nightmares. It's yeah. a very human thing. Yeah. It's, it does demonstrate his humanity mm-hmm. that, you know, there's an old woman who died, she was covered in veils. And there were flies going around her. As an adult, uh, you'd probably look at that and think, oh, that's a bit gross, but it probably yeah. wouldn't stay with you the way the horror of it would mm-hmm. stay with you as a child. So he really is like us. Yeah. Um, in that way, it's very tailor-made for him. It's his confession dial. Mm-hmm. It's his nightmare. Yeah. Let's say Missy yeah. ended up in her puzzle box. What would it be? Would it be really fucked up? <laughs> Like I'm just interested. Do no, you think, I, what do you I, think think, I think I think Missy's confession dial is a world without the Doctor. Ooh. Yeah. Well, a world where where the lack of Doctor is made evident before her. All oh, right. Maybe, because maybe because there's a, maybe there's certainly a of him in the in the castle that like there was a clown. Or 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 like maybe his face is always turned away. Maybe there's like a Doctor oh. who just doesn't look at her because at least this version of the Master she gets her kicks from like flirting with the doctor and and making him notice her mm. making him hate her making him be impressed by her yes um what do you think would be in missy's confession dial no idea but i reckon I, I just thought it would be an interesting thing like wouldn't it be great to see an episode w- with just missy that would be amazing like this but maybe her, like drawing parallels yeah. anti-parallels yeah. doing all sorts of interesting shit i just thought, maybe we should write to steven we should we should like write to the bbc because we might write to Dr. like Magazine. imagine if um they did something like what they did with the paul mcgann minisode but they did it for missy oh yeah like, like, well, that, that, what that was going on possible. with her in the time war yeah oh no i mean like this version of that because you couldn't devote a whole oh, episode yeah. without the doctor in it yeah, no. That, but, like, but like, but like, realistically, they, they they could do a mini episode. Well, like maybe that. he's the one talking to her inside her mind, TARDIS, because that's the other element of Heaven mm. Sent, isn't it? You've not. It would have been just enough to have this whole set, this 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 this, this puzzle for him, this yeah. trap. But we've also got this beautifully explored, explored thing where the TARDIS is his mind. Mm-hmm. The TARDIS is his mind palace. This Sherlock thing. People are comparing mm-hmm. it to Sherlock quite a lot. Yeah, I wonder why it's like Sherlock. Because Could it be because the there's the, the, the same writer writing it, maybe? Maybe, yes, yeah. So, so you've got that element as well, and you know, you've got the subtle elements, like when he's, he's killed by the veil, you know, and the TARDIS lights just mm-hmm. come back on, uh, and then 
as he talks, he's sounding weak, but he's also sort of slowly shrinking to the ground, and you don't quite notice it, but he's getting closer and closer to death as he... It all takes place in his mind. It's really beautifully done. It's like a film. This, this episode is like a film. A thrillingly scary one, uh, a beautifully made one. I, I love it completely. Um, I would like to say one more thing about the Murray Gold, who I think is the fourth person I was going to mention. He made a piece for when Peter Capelli is punching through this wall, that thrillingly triumphant mm-hmm. sequence. Uh, and it's essentially uh, a redo of This Time There's Three of Us mm-hmm. from The Day of the Doctor. I was saying this to you. It's another moment yeah. where the Doctor has a, a revelation that yeah. actually in this desperately impossible situation, he can pull through. Yeah. Uh, do you reckon that was what was going through Marigold's mind, the parallels between those things? What do you think? It's just a there's, there's been a lot of allusions to the 50th over the last two years. Yeah, and yeah, I'm, more than I'm, I'm really glad that they're doing that because it, it's... Um, it means that it was more than just a throwaway story. It means that the Doctor has absolutely taken hit from his experience of that into the future and that he has changed as a character because of it, yes. which is something important to have with a, with a 50th, something, something that big, something that important. Yeah. And I'm sure Murray Gold is also uh, alluding back to it. With his yeah, it's quite case. possible. Do you think this yeah. is the best Capaldi episode, Heaven Sent? That's a difficult question. Uh, I might say yes, personally. Isn't well, I actually yeah. still, my heart is still probably slightly more with The Witch is Familiar, just right. for, oh God, what they did in that one was so yeah. good with that for us. So I'm going to stick with that, but I think Heaven Sent, technically speaking, in terms of the effort put in, in terms of what they achieve and the boundaries they push with what the show can be, I, I, I have to give it that. I, I, no, I think it was just a copy of Time Heist. Like, you know how the Doctor is, you know, he's, set, he's going in cycles, he's set it up as a time loop. T- no, Time Heist is my favourite. Okay. Yeah, Alright, fine. By far and away. I mean, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one more thing. Capaldi has kind of come, I think, level with Matt Smith now in my mind. Only level? Say. Well, well. Interesting. I, it, it, he's so difficult. It, Matt Smith, for me, is just so difficult to surpass, to be honest, just in terms of how much I enjoy watching him, but that's just me. I think... I mean, Capaldi's just such a, a class act. You know, the scene, mm-hmm. for example, where he's got the eyepiece in, and yeah. he's, holding, he's waving the flower around yeah. to distract the veil, and you just you feel so comfortable with him. And then he judges the gravity and the air resistance mm-hmm. all in a few seconds, just so he can jump out the yeah. window and perform a stunt. But I did think of one thing that maybe he didn't consider. Um, yeah. How he could have fucked up this entire thing. Let's imagine that the skulls that were falling into the water yeah. piled up so high after billions and billions of years... But when he jumped out of that window, he didn't hit the water, he hit those skulls. No, no, I, I hear you, and um, I, <laughs> Sorry, I, I'd, also, I'd also considered that. However, skulls are just... They're just bone, aren't they? They, they crumble mm. under the weight That's, of each other. Yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 they degrade over time. Did you guess that it was the Doctor's skull? I, wor- I worked it out it? when I was meant to. Right. In the script. Right, yeah. okay. So it's sort of around the point that he was killed and then started... Well, at the point when, when the skull falls off, Oh, and you had down. a good look at it, yeah. And I was like, right. Because the thing he does with his clothes when he puts them back into the right position, I was like, this is a time loop thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's the skull. I was like, so this is a prison for lots of people and lots of people have failed in this task. And then I saw it fall down and I thought, that's what they're doing. They're all the doctor. Mm. There you go. And was, so that, that was my process of working it out. Do you know the skull was actually modelled on Peter Capaldi's actual head? I didn't know that. That's an interesting fact. Another sort of horror movie kind of... Yeah. Oh, it's kind of yeah. nasty. That's probably what Peter Capaldi's skull looks like. And Tim actually saw the skull in the very first place and thought, hmm, that looks a bit like Peter Capaldi. I, I think, didn't say anything, but... Yeah. Tell me, does Tim have a fob watch? Oh, shit. He's opening it right now! <laughs> I, th- I think that Tim operates on a higher plane of being than the rest of us. <laughs> he's, so he's, just, he's just brilliant. Yeah, well, he, he, like me, had the other horrible thought about Davros yeah. having his legs pulled off by the hand mines. Holy shit. I th- wow. I think just, just, That's just, fascinating. Well, yeah, I mentioned that in our ha- Magician's Apprentice review, the idea that maybe Davros came to be so disabled and mm. so... Unable to move because the doctor didn't rescue him. Mm-hmm. And the hand mines just went. <laughs> yeah. Horrible image, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. But much like with uh, Heaven Sent, the, those horrible images are just only alluded to. They're yeah. not explicitly said. 
that's the way Doctor Who should be. Mm-hmm. But it also leaves room to be quite, you know, harrowing and atmospheric, the way things like Under the Lake and Before the Flood are. Mm-hmm. You've got that real atmosphere. It's in, it's in the stuff that you don't show, as well as the stuff oh, that yes. you do show. And heaven said is about that. Well, in that they don't show you the image of an axe going through a woman's skull. But, yes. But through cutting between her deaf ears and the axe dragging against the floor, your brain just fills in the gaps and you're like, oh my god. Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh my god. <laughs> horrid, horrid, horrid. Um, well, I, I have one last thing to say myself, which is um, Stephen Moffat always has always referred to Midnight as being the best episode of Doctor Who. Really? He actually has. Well, people always come to him and they say, Blink, what's it like writing the best episode ever? And he's like, well, nobody ever mentions Midnight. Look at Midnight. Um, which I think is very interesting, because we were talking yesterday, not, not on tape. Hear that, Gattis? Um, <laughs> that, 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 about the admiration that the two have for each other? Yeah. In that Russell C. Davis would never rewrite any of Stephen Moffat's scripts, and that Stephen Moffat has, has viewed what Russell C. Davis did for the show as being so important to its success. Mm-hmm. Like, even though he does change things about, about Russell's formula, um, he still needs the formula in place to be able to subvert them. Um, but but he, he, Midnight was, I think, it was Russell T. Davis really putting limitations on himself. And what came out of it was so much superior because of that. Yes. And this is very similar because I, we pr- it's pretty much confirmed that Stephen Moffat thought he was leaving. And it feels like this is him finally doing his answer to Midnight, which is putting all these limitations on himself. And I think the writing just elevates to, to, yes. to, to get around those just things. Just as the Doctor puts himself in the most impossible mm-hmm. situation. It's almost representative, not just the Doctor's mindset, but mm-hmm. Stephen Moffat's mindset as he's yeah. writing it. I feel like Stephen Moffat has been trying to replicate Midnight. Like, just taking a little episode aside to try and do his Midnight. It's like claustrophobic. Yeah, because like, c- he did Listen, which was just a bit like Stephen Moffat's answer to it, but it, I don't think it quite satisfied him. And then he did this, and I think, I hope. This is his. I midnight. hope that he has found his Midnight. Yes. I think he has. If that is what he's looking for. That, as, as perfect as that would be in the end of the discussion, I have another thing I'd like to mention. Very good. Sorry. This is cleverly not the first time the Doctor has come to this follow box. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have all the skulls, of course, if mm-hmm. that had been the case. Um, we're on, like, year 7,000. He mm-hmm. looks into the sky and he sees the stars, and by the positions of the stars, mm-hmm. he works out that he has been there for 7,000 years. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a question. What about the first time he was there? Did he look at the stars and think, oh, I know where I am? The, the, the problem with time loops is starting them. And Stephen Moffat has never really been able to start. Well, a time that's the loop. thing. We've had a lot. Of he's time just able to, to. He's just able to write. In the middle, he's yeah. just able to write from the middle of a time loop. It, like if you remember Matt Smith coming back to give Rory the screwdriver, that time loop never starts. We just start in the middle of it. Mm. And so it is clever to write about time loops, but he's never quite successfully shown us the beginning of one. Yeah, I mean, maybe he found out where it was, but he was like... I mean, Work work of Genius, Time Heist, uh, does show us the start. Brilliantly, it's the perfect episode. But, um, <laughs> I love your obsession, not this sudden one. obsession with Time Heist. I'm just making fun of you. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. You're trying to make me go, oh! Yes, he did it, listeners! Yeah, I did it. Uh, and also, Confession Dial, he said, why can you see stars in the Confession Dial yesterday? I don't know if that... Well, yeah, why, why, why would you, if you're inside a little confession doll, see the stars? And how would you be able to tell the stars yeah. from where you're looking up in the sky? It's a bit weird, but, I mean, it is, it is a sort of unique, beautiful image that all this, this pain that he suffered for billions of years, well, he hasn't really suffered for billions yeah. of years, but, you know, is inside a confession dial. I don't know, do you think that was a bit weird and out of nowhere? Could have done with more of an explanation? Or do you think it works with well, it, it doesn't. I don't know if it needs an explanation, really. I think. Oh, that, I, I think because I think I think the the emotion of, of the episode is what drives it forward, rather than the mm. actual technical details. Well, what I I mean, yeah, I mean, personally, I'd have got. I I think it would have been even more beautiful to naturally not tell us where he was. Like it's yeah. just this mystery location in the universe. The same way that Gallifrey, we never knew where Gallifrey mm. was, and there was something quite haunting about that so as he breaks through this diamond wall he reaches the point well kind of like a TARDIS how like like the the box is just a door to another dimension Mm -hmm. like the the dimension exists outside of the universe technically and then the machine moves the box by opening wormholes and then you can step through the door Mm. into another place it could just be that he was somewhere but the confession dial acted as like 
Like a portal, maybe? Mm, maybe. Time Lord science, Tom, is, is very, uh, very well thought through. Yeah, and very based on... In the history on... of Doctor Who. Yeah. It's also very based on clockwork. I like that. I, re- I, I like that great. motif. It was like the, it was like even a, the veil was made of. It was clocks, like an allusion so. to the title sequence, actually. It was. Yeah, yeah. Which do you um, wonder if like that maybe the title sequence is actually meant to be us going into his confession dial? Like, I don't know if it's like that specific, so, but, like that. but the cogs are like the working of his mind. The cogs are like the moving of time. Yeah, they're a nice image. A clever little time. Yeah. the whole castle is like this. Yeah, it cogs is. Yeah. turning and things moving around and just. I need to I need to watch that again. I need to watch it again. I'll I'll do a, a midnight listen. Please do. Hellbent, no, whatever this one's called. Heaven sent. Heaven sent. Uh, triple omnibus. So it'll be fun. I mean, if you're looking yeah. for the most, uh, yeah, con- highly conceptual episodes, mm. then I'd say that's a good combination. Yeah. I love Heaven sent. My second favorite episode of series nine, and one of my favorite overall. Uh, huge congratulations to everyone involved. Thank you. No we'll problem, try Stephen we'll try that Hyam. hard next time. Well done, Stephen Hyam, yeah. for your work on Heaven Sent. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, oh, it looks like we've never got nowhere near the the chronolog time this time. That was only twenty seven minutes. What Mark Gatti should have done was reduce the time to make it harder rather than increase the time. Oh, silly! But man. you know, much like a time lord, his mind works in mysterious, in, in mysterious ways. ways yes. yeah. We'll be back next time for Hell Bent. Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Bird Nomahawk YouTube channel.